There is a tremendous dividing line in this country, and it's not based on social standing or on economic status. It doesn't exist because of where you live or what you do for a living or how many kids you have or how many kids you do not have. It's not as simple as attractive or homely or fit or fat. Uh, on which side of the line you stand has nothing to do with whether you ooze success or ooze sweaty, smelly perspiration like that guy in the third row over there. I'm actually talking about the dividing line of humor and political correctness. And by the way, sir, you smell fine. At least from up here, I'm not sitting next to you. Thank heaven. <laughs> Listen, humor exists to break taboos, bust stereotypes, and expose controversies. Stand-up comics and other humorists provide commentary that push social boundaries, forcing us to confront realities that would be very easy to otherwise ignore. When tragedy strikes, right on the heels comes comedy. And it's comedy that delivers the truth. So what if the truth hurts? Well, it can also be freaking hilarious. But here's the question. How far is too far? How soon is too soon? And are there topics that are simply off the table? That's always been for you to decide. It's been a personal reaction based on your personal sense of humor, your beliefs, and your opinions. But sadly, folks, that is no longer true. There are tastemakers, and I'm going to refer to them as shit stirrers out there, and they've got the power to affect change, often anonymously, and I think unfairly. Social media has imposed a new immediacy and a new set of rules on politically incorrect comedy. Words and thoughts that guys like George Carlin and other outspoken comics couldn't verbalize on TV are now part of everyday communications, and they are seemingly no limits to creative expression, which is a good thing. But 20 years ago, a comic could say absolutely anything potentially offensive in a nightclub, and it would garner an audience, and they would give a reaction, and then it would disappear. Laughter, booze, whatever, no real consequences happened. Now, such a comment is preserved, shared, and scrutinized via smartphone cameras, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, other social media outlets, and there can be big-time repercussions, which is absolutely, in my opinion, a bad thing. Take a look, uh, Gilbert Gottfried up here on the uh, screen. He was fired from his lucrative spokesperson gig as the Affleck duck because of his comedic tweets after the Japanese tsunami. He said things like, I just split up with my girlfriend, but as the Japanese say, there'll be another one around floating in a few minutes. Or Japan is really advanced, they don't go to the beach, the beach comes to them. Jason Biggs was similarly lambasted when he tweeted, anyone want to buy my Malaysian airline frequent flyer miles about 65 minutes after the crash. And there's a man by the name of Louis C.K., many of you may know who he is, many of you may not, who spent a lot of time in the media doghouse after making child molester jokes during Saturday Night Live's performance last May. Take a look, see what you think. <laughs> the 70s were very different. When, in the 70s, there was a child molester that lived in my hometown. And it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like, we caught a child molester. It was just like, yeah, that's the house where the child molester lives. <laughs> he lives where, hey kids, be, don't be stupid, or you'll get molested. Just stay away <laughs> from the child molester house. I know, because he did something to me when I was your age. So just stay away <laughs> from the child molester house. Because child molesters are very tenacious people. They love molesting childs. It's crazy. It's like their favorite thing. I mean, when you can, it's so crazy because when you consider the risk in being a child molester, speaking not of even the damage you're doing, but the risk, there's no worse life available to a human than being a caught child molester. And yet they still do it, which from you can only really surmise that it must be really good. I mean, from their point of view, from their, not ours, but from their point of view, it must be amazing for them to risk so much. 
Look, I can't key into it because I love Mounds Bars. I love Mounds Bars, it's my favorite thing, right? But there's a limit. <laughs> and because they are delicious. And yet, if somebody said to me, if you eat another Mounds Bar, you'll go to jail and everybody will hate you, I would stop eating them. Because they do taste delicious, but they don't taste as good as a young boy does and shouldn't <laughs> to a child monster, not to me, not to us, because we're all awesome. Uncomfortable, huh? Here's a question. Why were they punished for doing their jobs, for creating levity out of calamity? Simply because while some people laugh and retweet and move on, others take offense and they seek revenge via letter writing campaigns and job ending boycotts. These days, everybody seems to be a critic and everyone's empowered to take action to share his or her criticism. It's now perfectly acceptable to sit in your basement and blog and tell people off and incite an uprising among the masses. It's happened to me on Twitter many times. Except you know what? It's not okay. It's not acceptable in my mind and hopefully yours to do that. And if someone is offended and says, that's not funny, it's extremely likely that it actually is funny, just not to him or her. Sadly, that person's inability to separate their own truth from the humor is clouding their reaction. They've got the impetus to cause a firestorm. And with social media, they've got the means to do that quite well. So here's the question. Who's right? And who's funny? And what's offensive? Here's the bigger question. Who gets to decide? If something is deemed over the line, who put the line there in the first place? Shouldn't we all be able to decide for ourselves? And the bigger issue really is, has America lost its sense of humor? We grew up laughing at never-ending parades of comics on the Ed Sullivan Show, Hollywood Palace, and we accepted the stereotypes that Jews were cheap, Irish people were big drinkers, and Mexicans and black people were lazy. They didn't even have their own stereotypes, they had to share one. Gays were swishy blondes, and Polish people were dumb, and Polish blondes were really dumb. It's virtually all we heard, but we did a far, far better job at separating the humor from the reality that people do today. One of my best friends just celebrated his 91st birthday last week. His name is Bill Dana. I don't know if you remember him. He used to do a character called Jose Jimenez. Take a look at this. Many people do not realize that every year courses are given to prospective Santa Clauses to teach them how Santa Claus is supposed to act and speak. <laughs> what is your name, sir, and what course do you teach? My name, Jose Jimenez. <laughs> I, I to thank to, to Santa Claus. I, I teach to, to Santa Claus. So, I to Santa Claus. I teach Santa Claus to speak. This is Dave Hinckley, back with Jose Jimenez. You are back with me. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, I don't want to seem impertinent, uh, but just exactly what do you teach Santa Claus to say? Well, of course, I teach Santa Claus to laugh. You teach him to laugh? Yes, I teach him to say, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Funny stuff, right? Still holds up. But in the 80s, Bill was forced to stop doing that character by a complaint from the Mexican-American community. Insane. My favorite comedian of all time was a man by the name of Jack Benny. And I got to meet him, and to me, there was nobody better timing-wise. And the reason Jack Benny worked was he let everybody else around him be a star. And he sat back and was the straight man. He did a routine about every six shows. You all know it. I'm going to show it to you now with Mel Blanc. Take a look. Oh, uh, pardon me, mister, but did uh, my man come over and put some of my clothes in your luggage? Si. <laughs> Are you going to New York? Si. <laughs> Are you taking flight 18? Si. <laughs> What's your name? Sai. Sai? Si. My man 
told me you were going to visit some relatives in New York. Gee. A sister, is it? Gee. I'm afraid to ask this next one. What's her name? Sue. Could you do that today? I don't know. Entire stand-up acts were constructed around stereotypes, and without the internet, internet, there was no outcry when Don Rickles or Jack Carter, Shecky Green, Myron Cohen, Jackie Mason, Alan King, Norm Crosby, Milton Berle, slew of others would go on Sullivan, play Vegas, tell jokes, such as um, how do Chinese people name their babies? They throw them down the stairs to see what noises they make. Why do Mexicans eat beans for dinner? So they can take bubble baths. A black Jewish boy runs home from school one day and asks his father, Daddy, am I more Jewish or more black? The dad replies, why do you want to know, son? Because a kid at school is selling his bike for $50, and I want to know if I should talk him down to 40 or just steal it. <laughs> black guy walks into a bar with a parrot on his shoulder and asks for a beer. The bartender brings a beer and notices the parrot on the guy's shoulder, and he says, hey, that's really neat. Where'd you get that? And the parrot says, in the jungle. There's millions of them. Ah, see? Interesting. What's the word that starts with N that no one wants to call a black person? Neighbor. An African-American and a Mexican are in a car. Who's driving? The cop. Abe and Shlomo are strolling down the street one day when they happen to walk by a Catholic church. They see a big sign that says, convert to Catholicism and get $200. Abe stops, stares at the sign. Shlomo says, what are you doing, Abe? What's going on? And Shlomo says, Abe. I think I'm going to do this. He says, what, are you crazy? Abe thinks another minute. Shlomo, I'm going to do it. With that, he strides into the church, comes out 20 minutes later with his head bowed. So, says Shlomo, did you get to $200? Abe looks up and says, money, that's all you guys think about. <laughs> By the way, I got those from a racist joke website. And there's a link to each one of those jokes to Facebook and to Twitter, which is now how humor gets passed along these days. The art of joke telling is fading from the human experience because it's much easier to hit send and then share a joke with 400 people. Could tell it face to face, nobody does it. It's pretty sad if you ask me. Now back to these jokes, you may have been uh, you know, laughing a little bit at what's going on here or you may have been going to your internet and your phone and say Mark Summers is a racist and a hateful pig and sending it to TMZ and CNN. That my friends is totally up to you. The truth stated in these jokes, it's not my truths. I am not anti-Jew, I'm not anti-black, I'm not anti-blonde, anti-Mexican, anti-Polish, or anti-Irish. What I am, and I'll admit it right here, is anti-political correctness. And I am not alone, folks. Jerry Seinfeld recently said on ESPN that he now refuses to play college campuses because teens and college-age kids don't understand what it means to throw around certain politically correct terms. Jerry said they just want to use these words, that's racist, that's sexist, that's prejudice. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. He said there's a creepy PC thing going on out there that really bothers me. Now imagine this, folks. College campuses where free speech has always reigned is now not safe for open comedic expression. Earlier this year, I saw a New York Magazine article. Chris Rock said he also has stopped playing colleges because they are too conservative. Not in the political views, not like he says, like voting Republican, but in their social views and their willingness not to offend anybody. You cannot even be offensive on your way to being inoffensive. He also mentioned that the prevalence of social media forces comedians into self-censorship. He said it's scary because the thing about comedians is that you're the only ones who practice in front of a crowd. Prince doesn't run a demo on the radio, but in stand-up, the demo gets out to the audience. Now there's a few guys who write good enough, go on stage, do a perfect act, but everybody else has to workshop their material and get it really messy. Sometimes it gets messy when they do it. It can get downright offensive. Before everyone had a recording device and was wired like Sammy the Bull, you could say something that went, well, a little too far, and then you say, well, I crossed the line, and they brush it off. But if you think you don't have the room to make mistakes, it's going to lead to really safe humor. 
You can't think the thoughts you want to think if you think you're being watched. In other words, hello censorship and goodbye truth. I am very, very afraid of how the internet and today's cultural norms are threatening to redefine exactly what is funny. And it appears that comics like John Cleese, Russell Peters, Jim Norton, Pat Oswalt, Dennis Miller, and even Larry the Cable Guy have each taken a public stand, like me, against political correctness. There's a comedian by the name of Lisa Lampan uh, Lampanelli. She is very edgy, and she wrote in The Hollywood Reporter how political correctness is killing comedy. She said, here's the problem. Comedy, probably more than any other art form, is subjective. What jokes crack up your mom, your little brother, and your gay best friend will be completely different unless it's a video of a guy getting hit in the gonads with a pinata stick. That seems to be funny to everybody. She continued, but when you deny an artist the chance to explore his art, you're forcing his beliefs on him. By being politically correct, you're closing your mind to different points of view, which sounds a lot like being prejudiced. Most people don't know that I started off as a stand-up comic in 1976 at the Comedy Store. I was there about four or five years. I started when Jay Leno, Dave Letterman, Robin Williams all began, and I heard it all. Uh, um, Richard Pryor was there a lot as well. But somehow the internet has changed all of this. I was doing a show recently, I'm getting back on stage performing, and I used to do a show uh, magic-wise, and I would do a trick all the time and go to pick an Asian person just because I was doing some math that I wanted them to mess up. And I did a joke that I had been doing for 30 years, and when the Asian woman messed up, I, see, I said, I thought you guys were good at math. And the audience booed me, okay? And I kind of wondered, what's negative about saying Asians are good in math? And I'd like to know, is it because I'm not Asian? Can Asians make fun? of other Asians. Andy, the singer who was out here a few minutes ago, before he went on stage, told me that he was part Japanese and part Jewish. And I asked him if every December 7th he had the sudden urge to attack Pearl Schwartz. He didn't even get it. Um, <laughs> clearly there's no answer. But wait a minute, there may be an answer. Answer is to fight back and stop accepting censorship due to political correctness. Find your own truths. Learn from the humorous and keep free speech free. Perhaps John Avalon, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast said it best, social media is creating a sort of mob mentality. There's a pile on environment where people are all of a sudden acting as the police. They're gonna pile on anyone who says anything that offends them and it has the velocity of force and then we all shut down. So I'm asking this from you today. Please, let's not shut down. We must keep the conversation going. We must let the humorists keep their social commentary going. And that means making our own decisions and not let the reactionaries mold our truths. Please, let's keep laughing and most of all, let's keep thinking. We are, after all, individuals. And when we react as a group, we give up our individual rights. Hey, you guys were great. Thanks so much. Hope you learned something.